Hey, this is Khan, you're watching Ninja Pools. Welcome to this comprehensive guide to Arcanist damage in the Elder Scrolls Online. Arcanist is probably the easiest class to pick up. Its main damage ability is Fate Carver, a long channel which lets you push fewer buttons per minute but still pump out damage. It's strong and fun to use, but there are some drawbacks. If the beam gets interrupted, either by enemy attacks or by you dodging or blocking, you will lose quite a bit of damage. More importantly, it's the only thing in ESO that works like this, so if you play a lot of Arcanist, you're kind of only getting better at the Arcanist, and not so much at the game in general. Practice is practice at the end of the day, but that which you get from playing other classes is more transferable. Just keep that in mind. If you're interested in the lore and design of this class, check out this great video we made recently. And if you just want to build, check ninjapulls.com and the other videos on this channel. I will share some setups as I go, but in PvE, you're gonna need more than just one build. So this video is more about popping open the bonnet on the Arcanist, taking a look at the engine, how everything works, and how to make the most of this class. Whether you're just getting started, or have been playing a while and want to start maxing out your damage. Start with the passives. Fated Fortune. 12% critical damage and healing is the largest flat amount provided by any comparable class passive. Sure, we do have to trigger it, but it happens pretty automatically. We're often reliant on supports for the crit damage stat in Dungeons and Trials, and one of the reasons organized groups have so much more damage is this stat. Getting 12% for free makes it much easier for the Arcanist to max it out. So always keep those triangles rolling. Harnessed Quintessence and Hideous Clarity kind of work together. Quintessence is the one we're interested in for that extra weapon and spell damage, but Hideous Clarity is great because it helps our sustain by giving us resources back, you can't cast anything if you've got no juice, and because it then triggers Harnessed Quintessence, making permanent uptime possible. So these passives together make a powerful combo. Don't worry guys, you don't have to remember all this stuff, just keep in mind that it's there. And check your tooltips now and then to remind yourself how everything fits together. Psychic Lesion. Status effects like burning and poisoned can be a bit complicated to keep track of. Again, you don't need to be an expert, but all classes want to have at least a few status effects which are being triggered regularly. And this passive rewards us for doing exactly that. It adds up to a lot of extra damage, especially because of the increased proc chance. So use status effect whenever you can. Splintered Secrets Penetration is the other stat we're typically dependent on supports to provide for us. So this is another passive which makes Arcanist easier to prep for group content. Just remember that you can go over the pen cap, which is a waste of valuable stats, but that shouldn't be a common problem. Aegis of the Unseen Free Armor this will trigger whenever we have Fate Woven Armor or Runic Defense active, for example. Wellspring of the Abyss. More resource recovery for every tanky ability we have slotted. When you're in a trial group, you might only have one or two on the back bar, but then you shouldn't really need the sustain either. When you're solo, you're more likely to slot these abilities and also more likely to benefit from the passive. Circumvented Fate. Minor Evasion reduces damage from AoEs by 10%, a nice little freebie which we don't even have to think about since it triggers whenever we cast a class ability. Pretty much whatever you're doing, your Arcanist and your teammates will always have this buff. Implacable Outcome All classes have a passive for generating ultimate and it's worth knowing how they work. This is roughly equivalent to other classes but it lines up especially well with Fate Carver and we are particularly dependent on this passive since the beam keeps us from light attacking much of the time. Healing Tides. This doesn't affect us that much. If we as damage dealers need to heal, we usually need it right away. We're not gonna build up Crux first just so we can get 12% extra healing. We're just gonna hit it as soon as we need it. Still, if you're playing defensively for a few seconds and you happen to have Crux already built up, it's nice to know your heals are getting a boost. Hideous Clarity we already covered, Erudition is just a major recovery boost to Stam and Mag, and Intricate Rune Forms makes damage shields bigger and cheaper. In the DPS guides on our website I always put four key passives at the top for every class. 
In this case, it's Fated Fortune, Harnessed Quintessence, in combination with Hideous Clarity, Psychic Lesion, and Implacable Outcome. The others matter too, of course, but if you have room in your head for just a few, make it these ones. Just make sure you keep building and spending Crux, and use enchantments or abilities to get some status effects into your rotation. And all of these passives will be working for you constantly in the background. Next up, active abilities. Remember, we're coming at this from a PvE damage standpoint. So I'm not going to waste time on stuff we're not going to use. Start with Herald of the Tome, where most of our damage abilities are. The Unblinking Eye is going to be our main ult. Great damage in a medium-sized area, it is bigger than it looks, so you can nuke several targets at once if you're smart about where you place it. The Languid Eye Morph deals more damage, so that's generally the one to go for. But if your tanks keep moving the enemies out of your ult, maybe try Tide King instead. If you're nuking very large trash pulls and need to cover a larger area, you can use Fiery Rage instead from the Destruction Staff skill line. But generally, this is the only damage ult we need in PvE. Runeblades. This is the Arcanist spammable, which is generally overshadowed by Fate Carver, although it's more competitive than people realize. In fact, it can beat Fate Carver for single target damage, but doesn't compete in terms of cleave or ease of use. Even the escalating Runeblades morph, which explodes in an AoE on the third hit, can't keep up with the Fate Carver beam which is 100% pure AoE damage. But if you don't need any of that and just want pure single target damage, Writhing Runeblades might be the way to go. This and a few other Arcanist abilities are unusual in that their cost changes based on your primary resource. That means if your stamina pool is bigger, this will cost stamina. But if you respec, so your Magicka pool is the biggest, the cost of this ability will also flip to that resource. Arcanist is currently the only class which has this system. Fate Carver. This is the Arcanist's most unique feature. The longest channel in the game by far, 4 seconds plus the initial casting animation. If you cast Exhausting Fate Carver at 3 crux, it's close to a 6 second cast, and it replaces the role of a spammable in our rotation. High damage, long range and pure AoE, Fate Carver is extremely powerful when used effectively. It's also easy to use and fun to get that real-time sense of continuous damage as you position yourself optimally to hit every target. This makes it very easy for new players to get decent damage out of the Arcanist very early and without too much effort, although it can also get in the way once you start really trying to optimize your damage at the high end. That's because the sheer length of the channel makes it impossible to get perfect uptimes with all your dots and you have to judge on the fly whether to recast early or let things expire during the beam. That's not really something new or casual players need to worry about, but it is worth mentioning. The other drawback with Fate Carver is, as I said at the beginning, that it's not transferable to any other class, but it's still the most popular way to deal damage with an Arcanist, and if you're going that route, you want to build your whole rotation around it. Keep the rest of the rotation simple, and grab yourself some dots which last a long time so they don't interrupt your flow. Then just build up your crux and fire that beam as often as possible. Like Runeblades, the cost of Fate Carver always comes from your primary resource. When it comes to exhausting Fate Carver versus pragmatic Fate Carver, it really depends on whether or not you need that shield. It is very juicy, but most of the time you shouldn't need it. However, in solo content or very tough group content, it can be very handy. You'll have to be the judge, but in group content, damage dealers are generally expected to build for maximum damage, which is almost always going to be exhausting Fate Carver. An exception might be if you're using the Coral Riptide set, which increases your damage if you can keep your stamina low, and which is very popular on this class. Because Pragmatic Fate Carver becomes cheaper when fired with more Crux, you might find it easier to keep your stamina hovering in that sweet spot, and then you'll probably gain more damage than you lose by using this morph. Equally, if sustain in your group is really, really high, you might need to do the opposite. Talk to your group if you're not sure, and feel free to test both morphs to see which one works best. Personally, I use Pragmatic Fate Carver all the time in solo content, but very rarely outside of that. Abyssal Impact Another iconic ability and one of the weirdest and grossest in the game. 
This is either a crux builder or a crux spender. The morph we use is dictated by our choice of spammable. If you're using Fate Carver, you'll need Cephaliarch's Flail to build crux and charge your beam. If you're using Rune Blades, you're already building crux and will want Tentacular Dread to spend the crux for extra damage. It's worth noting, so far, everything the Arcanist does has been magic damage, but these two morphs are physical damage or frost damage. A quick note on Cephaliarch's Flail to those who've been playing Arcanist for a while. As of update 43, it no longer heals you unless you actually hit something with it. That might not sound like a major change, but you really notice it in solo content and when you're running between trash balls. Don't say I didn't warn you. Tomebearer's Inspiration. This is our unique class buff. For damage, use the Inspired Scholarship Morph and keep it up at all times. It deals automatic damage and gives us one free crux per cycle, so we only have to fire two flails or rune blades to get it back up to three. The other morph deals less damage and restores resources, which might be handy if you're tanking or doing solo content. Both morphs also grant major brutality and sorcery, important damage buffs which are easy to get, but it's very handy to have them for free. The Imperfect Ring, another important ability, just a bit more low key. A 20 second dot, again, magic damage, with a juicy synergy that deals frost damage. The Fulminating Morph is the most common, since it has this frost explosion after 6 seconds which hits all enemies in the area. You're probably going to want this one for group content, but for solo, you might get more value from Rune of Displacement. The range isn't amazing, and you can get similar effects from Scribing, but placing this on a priority target and having everything get yanked in just as you start beaming is one of the most satisfying things the Arcanist can do. Also, this is the reverse of Rune Blades and Fate Carver. Instead of its cost aligning with your primary resource, this goes the other way and always comes out of your smaller resource pool. Honestly, that's the bulk of what we're going to use, since Arcanist, Necromancer and Warden have their skill lines kind of separated into damage, tanking and healing. More than the other classes do anyway. Next, Soldier of Apocrypha, Gibbering Shield. You're extremely unlikely to use this in group content, since it scales with your max health, so it's much more efficient to run it on a tank. In solo content, it might be worth it if you run very high health, but if we need shields on a damage dealer, there are generally better ways to get them on this class, as we'll see in a moment. Runic Jolt. This is a taunt, so we should not use this in group content, unless our tank or raid lead specifically asks us to. For example, in big pulls with ads that cannot be chained, Runic Sunder might be useful in solo content, since it grants you extra armor while reducing your enemy's armor and their damage done by 5%. Plus, slotting it also reduces your damage taken by a further 6% if you have full crux. That's quite a bit of extra mitigation, so if you find yourself struggling to survive a particular boss, this might just be enough to tip the scales in your favor. Runespite Ward This is one of those shields we were talking about. Again, it scales with max health, but with Impervious Rune Ward, the most common morph, the initial one second shield is so ridiculous that it can go over 16k even on a damage spec. Clearly, this isn't something we're going to need very often, but for those times when you're dealing with pretty major incoming damage, you can just spam this for a few seconds of immortality. It also consumes Crux to heal you, which is why tanks use this morph a lot. Fate Woven Armor Major Resolve is one of the most important buffs in any class toolkit. We should always have it rolling and should know exactly how to get it if no one is providing it for us. This is the Arcanist source. Crux Weaver Armor is most likely the morph you'll want, since it can help us build Crux faster and charge our Fate Carver earlier. Sometimes DDs use it specifically for that reason. If they know they're going to be taking damage, this will shorten the gap between beams so you only need to flail once. Then it can even increase your DPS. The other morph is more mitigation focused. Runic Defense. This is a support skill. Minor resolve for the group, not as crucial as major resolve but still good to have. It also grants you, the caster, minor protection and auto heals you if you take damage below 50% health. This can be handy in dangerous trash pulls 
pop this as a pre-buff before running in, and if you're in hot water within 20 seconds, instant burst heal. The Still Waters morph immobilizes enemies, while the Freedom morph grants you immunity to crowd control, plus some extra armor. Rune of Eldritch Horror Another support skill, it's pretty common to get someone in the group to run the Rune of the Colorless Pool morph because it's a very easy way to keep up Minor Brittle and Minor Vulnerability, both pretty important debuffs. So if you don't have Arcanist supports or any other sources of this in the group, which is kind of unlikely, a damage dealer might be asked to run this. Finally, Curative Rune Forms. Vitalizing Glyphic. I have never seen a damage dealer use this, maybe in ambitious groups with just one tank, one healer and 10 damage dealers, you might be a Rojo Arcanist DD and drop this for burst phases, however most of the time we'll see it run on a healer, so watch for when they drop it and make the most of the extra weapon and spell damage. And if it's an Arcanist healer with Pillager's Prophet, watch your ultimate and get ready to fire it again early. The Glyphic is pretty easy to spot but it definitely helps to know immediately what these effects are and how you should respond to them. Rune Mend. This is our class Self Heal. Well, if you're solo, it's a self heal. It's actually a smart heal, so if you're in a group, it will go to whomever needs it. Both morphs have their uses. They're both burst heals and crux builders. But Evolving Rune Mend adds a small heal over time, while Audacious Rune Mend applies minor heroism to targets below 50% health. One thing that can be an issue is that the cost, like Fate Carver, always comes from your primary resource. That can be frustrating if you need a heal but your main resource is running low and your secondary resource is just sitting there completely full. So build smart and try to anticipate that and if necessary find other heals which use your off resource. Remedy Cascade. This is Fate Carver but with healing instead of damage. It's very fun to use but even healers don't equip it that often. As damage dealers, we're very unlikely to ever need it, but the burst heal is incredibly strong, especially the curative surge morph. Chakram Shields. This is the other shield that was mentioned earlier. Both this and Remedy Cascade, the healing beam, have their cost governed by your primary resource, just like Fate Carver. Chakram shields are smart shields that curve towards your teammates, up to four at once. So if you're in a dungeon group, you will always get one. It's a pretty fat shield, and the destiny morph makes it even stronger if you stack them, while also building crux when you cast it. The tidal morph spends crux to heal the targets while their shield lasts. With the shields we already have access to through Pragmatic Fate Carver and Impervious Rune Ward, you'd need to have a specific reason to equip this one as a damage dealer. Arcanist's Domain This AoE is big and stacked with buffs for damage and recovery. Most trial groups want this, so don't be surprised if there are no Arcanist supports around and you get asked to run it. Zayna's Empowering Disc is the usual choice because it lasts longer. Once the AoE expires, the buff actually lasts another 10 seconds. So pro tip, if you're in charge of this, just recast it alongside your 30 second abilities like Inspired Scholarship. But if you fancy a bit of soft healing as well, if you're solo for example, you could take the other morph. Apocryphal Gate. This is a very niche mobility skill. Tanks often use the fleet-footed gate to zip between trash pulls or to game specific mechanics like Yazela's firebombs, the other morph lets your allies use the gate as well. Not something damage dealers use very often, but there are always going to be little tricks you can do with it if you want to. Okay, so what are the primary abilities for an Arcanist DPS from those we've looked at? For typical boss fight setups, it's going to be Exhausting Fate Carver, Cephaliarch's Flail, Inspired Scholarship, and Fulminating Rune, with the Languid Eye as our ultimate. But there are plenty of tweaks you could make. Pragmatic Fate Carver if you need the shield and don't mind the damage loss. And if you're more interested in single target damage or just don't want to use the beam, Writhing Rune Blades and Tentacular Dread. But this is a less versatile setup as discussed earlier. That's a basic framework with lots of slots left. The typical move is to slot some long dots like Quick Cloak and Scolding Rune because they won't get in the way of us beaming so much. Also, the duration lines up nicely with Inspired Scholarship. Barbed Trap is also pretty standard if you're playing at or close to melee range. Blockade of Fire on the back bar with the Maelstrom Inferno Staff 
or if you're using rune blades, Stampede on the back bar with the Maelstrom two-handed works great. Fill the remaining gaps with Fighter's Guild abilities to buff your damage via the Slayer passive, or slot some extra utilities such as Cruxweaver armor for that major resolve, a shield, a self-heal, Razor Caltrops or Elemental Susceptibility for the Major Breach if you're doing solo stuff, and Remorph to Rune of Displacement to stack enemies, stuff like that. There's quite a lot of space we can play with on our bars, so we can change our loadout quite significantly without really changing the core rotation and playstyle, which is Flail, Flail, Beam, Flail, Flail, Beam, and so on. And because of the dynamic cost of several of these abilities, Magicka and Stamina setups are identical. We just need to use different food and gear to make the build work. The fact that Flail costs Stamina and we're spamming it quite often does force Magicka Arcanist to run Tristat potions for recovery on both resources or to run food with less health. Not a major problem and something that a lot of Stamina Arcanists do anyway. The main reason Stamina Arcanist is more popular is Coral Riptide, by many measures the strongest damage set in the game, and not easily compatible with Magicka setups. But if you're not using that set anyway, or if you're going with Rune Blades as your spammable, the differences between Magicka and Stamina are almost non-existent. I've got videos for both Stamina and Magicka Arcanist on the way, with a super detailed rotation guide which is the main thing you're going to need to deal great damage with this class. Gear and setups can and should change from fight to fight, so I'm not going to give you one build to use, but here's a starting point, my default boss setup and my default trash setup. Loads more info at ninjapulls.com. It's a great resource we've worked really hard to put together, and we keep it updated every patch. There's also some more tips on champion points, alternative sets you can use, and all the rest. So that's almost everything you need to understand this class and construct your build. But there are some other points worth mentioning. Do not stop light attacking just because you're wearing the Urmage Mythic. Light attacks are not just for damage. They also proc your weapon glyphs and more importantly, generate ultimate. I've seen so many Arcanists losing massive amounts of damage because their light attacks are sporadic and the gaps between their ultimates get longer and longer. And in fights where you need to block or dodge frequently, or where enemies use stuns and knockbacks, Arcanist can be a real pain because of Fate Carver. You build up your crux, charge the beam, only to start firing it and immediately have it cut off losing your entire burst. Try to be smart about this in advance and either time your beams accordingly, swap to a runeblade setup or just bring a different class. Arcanist is a brilliant, bizarre creation by Zoss, very entertaining to use and super effective in fights against lots of enemies. Like I said, stay tuned for the rotation videos, where I'll show you how to easily break 100k on any class, but especially this one. I'm always happy to answer your questions, hop on Twitch and say hello, join our Discord and send me a DM, you can find me on there as Khan, and please, please help us spread the word by sharing our videos. We keep hearing that our content is the best out there, but this channel is still very small, and we know there are so many more players who will benefit from these guides we're making. Thanks so much for your company, and for watching to the end, I'll see you in the next one.